and let's get started. <clears throat> so on graphs, they can give you these graphs on the coordinate plane. When you're on the coordinate plane, we have our x-axis and our y-axis. And when you name a point, you're doing the directions from the origin. The center of the graph has its own special name called the origin. Uh, welcome to the person who just joined. Just to recap, we're talking about graphs and we discussed that there's an x and y axis and the center of the graph is called the origin. When you plot a point, every point is x axis first, y axis second, which means you're traveling right or left first, up or down second. Sometimes when they ask for a solution, we'll actually do a problem on this and need a solution, um, they'll give a coordinate and they might give it in reverse order to try and be confusing. They always want X to go first, Y to go second. So at this point, if we start at the origin, we would be walking right two spaces and then going up three spaces from there. And that gives us the actual coordinate. This would be the coordinate two comma three. So we need to know that information uh, because if they ask us to name one of these points, then we need to know how to name it. So on this graph, they can actually ask us a lot of different pieces of information on the graph. Um, and we just had one more person join. So I wanna just recap really quick again. We are talking about graphs, and we're gonna talk about some important parts of this graph that they might ask you about. So on a graph, they may ask you about the maximum or the minimum. That is one possible piece of information they could ask you about. So the maximum and the minimum are just the highest point and the lowest point. Not all graphs have both. This particular graph has a maximum and a minimum, but if we only had maybe just the left side of this graph, that would only be a maximum. So, and some lines don't have, or some graphs don't have either. If you had a line that has no maximum or no minimum because it goes up forever and down forever. So if they asked you to find the maximum or the minimum, they might want the actual coordinate for that. So we would need to be able to label this coordinate. So what point is this maximum at? How far left do we go? And then how far up do we go to get to the maximum? Okay, I have two people saying four, six, which is very close. The only small change that needs to be made. Since we are going left, and I did not mention that, we only did one point. Since we go left, that is considered the negative direction. So the four should be a negative four. But the six is going up, so it's positive. And I should have specified that when I introduced it. So to the right will be a positive value, and to the left will be negatives. And going up will be positives, and down will be negatives. So left four, up six takes us to that maximum value. What is the coordinate for the minimum value?
So we have one response of negative five, one, which is close. It's probably hard to read this on your screen. Um, this value is actually only at a negative four. One, two, three, yeah, that only goes four spaces down, but that's just because we're on a computer screen. Sometimes it's hard to see that. And then you do have to still be super careful of your order. Always do your right or left value first, and then you're up or down. We went right one space, so one is the first number of the coordinate. And it's a common, common thing to happen, which is why, especially if it's a multiple choice question, they will put the version where it's in the wrong order. So you've got to watch out to have the correct order. Always go left or right first, up or down second, and it goes down four spaces. Um, also be careful when you're counting the first spot, that is zero, that is not one. You don't get a one until you make a movement. So then as Tasha said, the correct answer is one comma negative four. Um, just keep that correct order. So another key feature of this graph, oh, before I forget, maximum or minimums, they could ask you for the actual coordinate, or they could state find the maximum value. It's a small difference. It sounds the same. But when they ask for the maximum value, they want the highest point only. They don't care how far left or right you've gone. So if they say find the maximum value, they only want the six. And they will list negative four as an option. They would list both of these numbers. And they're related, but when they say the words maximum value, they want the six. If they say the words minimum value, then which of the two numbers would they want? The one or the negative four for the minimum value? Which one is the minimum value? Negative four. Good. So it's just a small word thing, but it can be super confusing um, because they will list both of those. So negative four is the correct minimum value. The other parts of this graph, some of the key parts are these points where we cross the x-axis. We actually cross the x-axis three times, and these have a couple of names. They could call them x-intercepts because they're intercepting the x-axis or they could call them zeros. They can ask a question saying, find the zeros of this function. Okay. So if they say find the zeros, it's kind of like this maximum and minimum value. Saying to find the zeros does not mean you need the entire coordinate. For the zeros, they only want the x value. So like this one would be one, two, three, four, five, six spaces. So one of the zeros is negative six. And this case, when they say that term, we don't need the entire coordinate. What are the other two zeros of this function? Negative one and positive four. We have one here and over here. So they could list them like this, negative six, negative one, four. They could actually say x equals negative six, x equals negative one, x equals four. They can list them a couple different ways. They could not put parentheses around it because these are not actual coordinates when they're listed like this. If we did want to list the coordinate, 
we do go left first, so the negative six comes first, comma, zero. The zero here means we did not go up or down after that. We stayed in the same spot after we moved to the left. So the last key point on this graph, I know it's getting kind of busy, a lot of drawing on there, so hopefully we can isolate this one last point. That point there is called the y-intercept. It does not have a second special name. They would just have to state, find the y-intercept. Um, and this one doesn't cross exactly. It's in between negative two and negative three. So we might have to estimate it or they'd give a better picture where it crosses exactly. The y-intercept for this one would be negative 2.7. Some people might say negative 2.8. If it's multiple choice, they'd only have one obvious answer. And just another key word that you might need to know if you're going up on a graph. So we always read a graph from left to right. So starting on the left, if we travel to the right on the line, we're going up. They can call that increasing. And if we're going down, we call it decreasing. So just a vocabulary word that they might throw in a question so we know what it means. So again, a lot on this, there's a lot of information and things they could actually ask. Um, they would not ask it all at once. They would pick one piece and ask about it. So what else they can do is ask what a specific graph relates to. Every graph has a corresponding equation. So we have to have a general idea of what would the equation look like or what's the name for the equation and what would the picture look like. Linear is one of the most commonly used because it's seen a lot in algebra and it's also easy to know what it looks like because it has the word line. So from the four of these, which one is the straight line? Which one's linear? So we have two answers of A, and you're correct. That is linear. Equation-wise, linear equations always have an X and a Y. And then we can have some other constants involved in it. So it might look like something like Y equals negative 3X plus 4. We know that's linear because it has an X and a Y and then a couple other numbers. The rest of the pictures, we have absolute value. That is a V shape. And it will also have an X and a Y, but it will also have the absolute value symbol. These lines, these bars are the absolute value bars. The next one, C, is called a quadratic. It's that kind of U shape. They'll also call it parabola. And that always has an X squared. And I'm just writing random numbers. They can be any numbers. If there's an X squared anywhere in the equation, then it's quadratic. And then D is a circle. It's going to have X squared and Y squared. Okay. 
So with lines, they can sometimes get a little more specific. With lines, they might want you to actually graph the line. The problem is lines are best graphed if we have the equation y equals mx plus b format. If it's written like this, we automatically know what's called the slope of the line, and we automatically know the starting value of a line. And the starting value is the y-intercept. It's where it crosses the y-axis. So our equation is not given in this slope-intercept form. And it's kind of hard to rewrite it into this slope-intercept form. It's not impossible, but it's kind of hard. So there's a couple options of how to figure out which one is the correct graph. Um, we can use the answer choices and plug in values. So we could pick a point on our graph, like this is the coordinate two comma zero, and we could take our equation and we can plug it in to see if it actually works out. When we plug it in, once we've picked our coordinate, we do have to put them in the right spot. So from the coordinate two comma zero, which of those numbers is the X value? So we have a six in the equation, but we're looking at just the coordinate itself. From this coordinate, either the two or the zero is the x value of the coordinate. Good. So two is the x value, zero is the y value. It always goes in order. So when we plug it in to check, two times two minus three times zero, 2 times 2 is 4, 3 times 0 is 0, and 4 minus 0 is 4. So if you're doing this method, then you get something that's called either a true or false statement. This is a false statement because 4 does not equal 6. That means A is not our answer choice. So using this method, we do have to check a couple of times. We've got to keep going until we find a correct answer choice. Um, so if we try answer choice B, we pick any coordinate. Now I don't want to just pick any random spot on the line. Like here is a good spot on this line because it's where one of these lines crosses another. So our line, our graph we're looking at, it goes through the crosshair. So what is this coordinate? We've got to start from the origin and go over and down to decide what's the actual coordinate here of this point. three comma four. Again, watch for your directions. Those are the correct numbers. That is the right counting. But when you go left, it's negative. And when you go down, it's negative. So that's our coordinate. We can plug it in again to see if this works. We replace x with negative three and y with negative four. So then two times negative three is negative six. Negative three times negative four is positive 12. Good, so we've made the correction. Negative three, negative four is the correct coordinate. Uh, and then once we've plugged it in, get negative six plus 12, which is six. So this is a true statement. That means this is our correct line.
So luckily, we didn't have to do all four. You may have to check more. If this had not been it, we would move on to uh, answer choice C and try that one. So the next one is just more of interpreting a graph. Sometimes they just give you a situation and say, draw this situation out. So the situation is Antonio walked to school at a constant rate. That's an important piece of information. Constant means it's going to be a straight line of some sort. Um, if it was a variable rate, it might be moving up and down kind of in a curve. Then he spent the next six hours at school. To save on time, he took the bus home, which made his commute one fourth as long. Which graph could represent Antonio's distance from home? And it's hard to read probably, but the bottom is time and the left is distance. And that's the same for all of them. All of them say time and distance. So it's his distance from home. So a constant rate, he's going to be moving away from home. And then at school, he's not moving any distance from home. He's in the same spot. So it would be just that straight line. And then he has to go home. So doing a general picture, okay, so a couple people say C. We definitely know it's not B and D. We do have to double check between A and C because they both look pretty similar. And you guys are correct that it is C because walking takes longer. The line for walking shouldn't be as steep as the line for riding the bus. So the answer choice A would be if he rode the bus to school and walked home. So they can also, with our graphs, get our geometry involved. This particular one, they've given us three points and they label these points. In geometry, instead of just drawing the dot, they usually give it a name. So point A, point B, point C, and they say the word vertices. Three vertices, when you have any quadrilateral or triangle, any shape, made up of straight lines, the pointy part of that shape is called the vertice. And vertex is if there's only one, vertices if there's more than one. So three vertices of a quadrilateral are shown below. Quadrilateral means some sort of four-sided shape. Quad usually refers to four. So where should point D be located in order to make quadrilateral ABCD a parallel parallelogram? So we have to know what is a parallelogram. There's actually quite a few different types of quadrilaterals. We have squares, which is probably pretty familiar. Rectangles, pretty familiar. Rhombus is like a tilted square. All four sides are equal or congruent. And parallelogram is a tilted rectangle where the left and right are equal and the top and bottom are equal. Um, some other ones are trapezoid and kite and I think that is it. So we need to know which one of these points will give us a parallelogram. Usually what I do is I plot the point and draw the shape out and see, does this look like it's a parallelogram? So I do the answer choices again. I say, okay, answer choice A, if I connected these dots with straight lines, Does this look like a parallelogram? Does it look like you took a rectangle and just tilted it? 
Okay. One person says no. It almost does, but you're right. This tilt from C to B is a little bit different from than this tilt from zero to A. So that one didn't work. So A is out and we'll try answer choice B. Negative one zero. Does that look like a parallelogram? Okay, so we have a yes, could be a parallelogram. So when we're using the answer choices, we're gonna put a, a question mark there. We're gonna say, it might look like a parallelogram. Let's see if there's one that works even better. So it might be B. It looked kind of like a parallelogram, but let's try the rest to be sure. Negative one, one. Does that look like a parallelogram? Yes. So between the two, let's maybe draw them both out at the same time. Which one looked more like a parallelogram? Answer choice B or answer choice C? Oh, and we got an answer already. C looks better. Yep, so C is our answer. It fit better to be a parallelogram. So this one just gives you a line segment, but it's, this is still considered geometry because they're giving you a line. And now it's asking what the distance is. So point P is located at negative four comma four, and point Q is at two comma two. So what is the distance between point P and Q? For this, we need the distance formula, um, which I believe is on your reference sheet. So I'm gonna look that up really quick. This is the page that you'll actually have on the test, and they do have the distance formula. So you don't need this one memorized, but we do need to know how to use it. There's a lot going on here. So distance formula is x2 minus x1 plus y2 minus y1. So when you're looking at your points, we've talked about how each point is an x and a y value. So the reason they use the twos and the ones is to say one of these points is considered the first point. So x1, y1 for the first point. One of these is considered the second point. It doesn't actually matter which one is which. Just pick. If I'd picked x2, y2, and x1, y1, it would still work. So once you've identified and labeled, okay, first point, second point, then we plug the numbers in all of these variables will be replaced. Instead of writing x2, what number should we put there? Two, the x2 value is a two. And this little two had nothing to do with it. That's just saying that was the second point. So x2 minus x1 was our negative four. Notice we do get a minus negative four. Plus y2 minus y1, our y2 value was also two. Minus y1 is a positive four, so just minus four instead of our minus minus. So when we're simplifying this, we need to do inside the parentheses first. It follows those order of operations. So if we have two minus negative four, what do we get when we do a two minus a negative four? Uh, 
And this one can be confusing because of the minus minus part. Okay, so we have one answer of negative two. That would be correct if it was only two minus four. The minus minus makes things tricky. Two minus four is negative two, but two minus a negative four, oh, oh I have to use parentheses on Google Calc. Negative four is six. Every time you have a minus minus, that's the same as having one plus symbol. But you can always just plug it into a calculator as well. So you do have to be careful with that minus minus. And it's just a common mistake again that you see all the time is that minus minus trips people up. But then this one is just a regular two minus four, so it is the negative two. Next, we have to raise it to the second power. That means we're doing six times six and negative two times negative two. So six times six, we get 36. And negative two times negative two, we get positive four. Two negatives multiplied together make one positive. So then we still, we're not gonna worry about the square root yet. We want to combine these together. We add the 36 and the four, which makes 40. Now square root of 40, we have to use a calculator for. There's just no other way. Sorry, wrong direction. Square root 40 gives you the decimal 6.32. So if they ask you to put it in decimal format, you would um, have to know what to round to. You know, they could say round to the tenth or the hundredth, and that would determine how many digits you actually write out. The other option is maybe they keep it exact. Um, so if you have a couple answer choices and you've gotten to this point where you're like, well, I have the decimal, I don't know which one of these is the decimal 6.32, you would just wanna plug each answer choice into your calculator and check that. Two times the square root of five is 4.47. It is not the right decimal. So then you try it again. Uh, two times square root 10 is 6.32. That's our match. So another geometry type question they can ask, we did distance formula. This one gives an entire triangle, ABC, and asks you for the midpoint. The midpoint is the middle of the line. And specifically they said line a to C. So we can kind of eyeball it and kind of figure out the midpoint. Some of the time we can just kind of look at it and we're like, well, halfway looks about there. So which answer choice would be the midpoint? Zero, one. If there's ever two that look close and you're like, well, I have two possible answer choices, um, there is a formula for midpoint, but it is not on your formula sheet. So this one you would have to have memorized. So for midpoint, you're basically finding the average of the X values and the average of the Y values. Oops, that should be y1.
So if we actually named each coordinate, then finding the average, we take our x's and our y's, and we say, well, one of them's 0 0.1, one of them's 0 0.2, and we plug them in. 2 plus a negative 2 divided by 2, and 0 plus 2 divided by 2. With fractions, you do need to do anything on top or bottom first. This time on the top, we have to combine these. 2 plus negative 2 is our 0, and 0 plus 2 is 2. And then we can do our division. Even though it's a fraction, we know the division bar really is just division. 0 divided by 2 is 0, and 2 divided by 2 is 1. I think it's more likely you can just look at the picture and figure it out, but it's good to know this formula just in case. So I used the same picture, but this time instead of asking about midpoint, they may also ask you to find the slope. So from A to B, we specified points A and point B, what is the slope? I'm also, yep, I am sure that this is not on here either. This is another formula you would need to have memorized. We use M as the representation of the letter slope. And the formula is Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. You might have also heard it as rise over run. Both of these work. So if you want to do this kind of formula, you would have to label these coordinates again before you can plug it in. So A is left 2, so negative 2, and up 2, so positive 2, and B is right 3 and up 4. So now that we have our two points, we decide we have our first point and our second point. So distance formula and midpoint formula both started with x's. Slope starts with y's. So what do we put for our first y value? So y2, what number are we going to enter in? Good, 4. And then our y1 is at the other point. Then our x values, we have x2. So it's super important, again, if you start with y2, start with x2. You don't want to switch and then put negative 2 first when you started with x2 and y2. So then fractions, you do anything on top or anything on bottom first before we worry about any kind of division. For minus 2 is 2, and then we have this situation again where it's a minus minus. 3 minus negative 2 is the same as 3 plus 2, which is good. 5. Thank you. So 2 over 5, if we try and divide it, we get a decimal. For slope, they never put it as a decimal they're going to leave it as 2 over 5. You do have to watch for any fractions that could reduce. If we say got a slope of 2 over 4, what can we reduce 2 over 4 down to? One half, good. So 
Um, that was all geometry stuff. This I thought of later. I probably should have put it in the algebra section, but um, I can't go back and change everything. So I just had to add it in at the end. So with our linear functions, we talked about linear patterns one of the days where we had like a table and we had to come up with an equation or find what was going to come next. With our linear functions, they can ask you to interpret a graph and say, well, what does each of these values mean? And usually there's a situation that goes with it. So this situation says, a hot air balloon starts its descent from 540 feet. It descends at a rate of 60 feet per minute. The graph models the situation. What does the point P on the graph represent? So, so each of these values do give us information about the picture. They ask specifically about point P, but let's talk about what each of them mean. So 540 feet being our starting point, that's the spot on the y-axis where we cross the y-axis. We started at 540 feet. Then it descends at a rate of 60 feet per minute. That is the slope or rate of change. They can call slope rate of change and it's easier to remember since it's feet per minute. That's something changing over time. So rate of change is a good description for this too. So our slope would be how far down and over we're going. So point P is down here at the very bottom of the graph. And we're hitting it on the time axis. And we hit it specifically at nine. So after nine minutes, what do you think happens to the hot air balloon? If we're now hitting the X axis, we're hitting the bottom of our graph. What do you think the air, hot air balloon has done? It's landed, it's hit the ground. So the P represents that it took nine minutes to hit the ground or to land. That is a better description. They could, before we get to the second question here, they could also just ask, you know, like after five minutes, what's your height? So they could ask you just to interpret the graph and you'd go over to five minutes and up to the line and decide, well, that's between 200 and 300. So we're about 250 feet in the air after five minutes. So the second part is what is an equation that models the situation? This goes back to our linear patterns. With our linear patterns, we said it was always y equals the rate of change, or I just called it change, times x plus the starting value. So the amount that's changing should always go with letter x. The amount that you start with is always to the side. So what number was our change? What number should go with the x? 60, good. And then they gave us a starting value of 540 feet. When they write these out, they can write it like this. They can also change the order. They could put 540 plus 60x, 
either way, these are both correct. Um, they change it up just to be a little bit confusing, but either order works and they're both considered correct as long as the 60 is touching the X and the 540 is on its own. So that's actually all I had prepared for today. Um, we have about 15 minutes of what I had planned left for time-wise. I guess I underestimated uh, how many questions and things we needed to talk about. Um, so we could either end here for today. We could, I could take questions from you if you have a particular topic you want me to cover. Or I could even just go to one of the OGT um, example tests they have online and we could work through a couple of those problems. So what do you guys think? So OGT website, if you Google OGT math, or if you need to take one of the other tests, you could do science, all that. Then we go here and they have a couple of example tests and we can pick a test to open and have some practice problems. So this was the actual OGT in 2009. I'm sure it looks a little different now, but they should keep the same format and same types of questions. And there's a lot of stuff we don't really need. Then we have some questions. So this first question, a mother is keeping a recording of how her new baby's weight changes as the baby grows. The mother's record is shown in the table below. Gives us age and weight. So what type of graph should she use to show the baby's weight changed over time? Line, histogram, circle, or box and whisker? Good, A. This one's pretty straightforward. We talked about last time with the statistics, anything that changes over time, line graphs are best. Okay. This is related to the hot air balloon question we just did. It's gonna be the same kind of setup. So Jill charges a base rate of $25 per lawn plus $18 for each hour she mows the lawn. Which equation gives the amount of money M Jill earns from mowing a lawn for H hours. So those linear patterns have that rate of change in the starting amount, and you guys have picked the correct one, B. 18 was the rate of change because it was each hour she mows. Good. Here's some more geometry. And um, we talked about angles a couple of times ago. So in which figure is the measure of angle one equal to 45 degrees? So angle one, I wonder if I can draw on this, maybe. Maybe not, I thought I had a way to annotate, but I cannot. So we're looking at the space between these two lines and we want the one that's exactly 45 degrees. So angle A, it's kind of easy to just look at, or sorry, answer choice A. Looking at it, this one looks like it's 90 degrees. It looks way too big to be 45 degrees. It looks like one of those corners. So we can kind of eliminate A, but B, C, and D all look pretty close to each other. I'm gonna draw them out. So we have to remember what each situation possible there is. So with our parallel lines, there were two possibilities. Either these are congruent or they add up to 180. And we looked at the size to determine that. This angle's pretty big. This angle is pretty small. You need only a small arc to cover it. 
So if this and this adds up to 180, what would angle one have to be so that 145 plus whatever we get for angle one, that's going to equal 180. So we want to know what angle, angle 1 here, what angle when you add it to 145 equals 180. We need a number here that adds up to 180 when you add it to 145. Good, 35. 145 plus 35 is 180. You can also just subtract 180 minus 145 gives you that leftover amount of 35. So this one's close, and it looks like it could have been 45, but it is not. This situation is kind of similar to the parallel lines. Either these two things are congruent, or they add to 180. We can have both setups with these lines. So 145 and 1, should those be congruent or should they add up to 180 degrees? So are they congruent? Are they the same or are they different and add to 180. Okay. So congruent is when they're the same size. So like this arc and this arc, the green arc is a lot smaller than the purple. If we were congruent, we'd be across from each other. This angle down here is also 145. So when they're next to each other on a straight line, they should also add up to 180. And since they used 145 again, we already know that this is 35 because 145 plus 35 gives you the 180. So we only have one more option. We have eliminated all the others, but just to recap why this option works, this symbol right here tells you a certain amount. That symbol, how many degrees is in an angle with this kind of symbol? When you have that right angle symbol, that was exactly 90 degrees. 45 is what we're going to get um, when we do the two angles added together. But the entire thing, any corner piece, is 90 degrees. So to find angle 1, we would do 90 minus 45 which gives us 45. That means this other piece of the angle is our 45 degrees. Good. Um, so we did have one person join. Sorry, we're almost done. We have about five more minutes. We've been practicing a few problems from the OGT test that they have released online. And we just talked about this one. Um, and talked about how answer choice A was 90 degrees. Answer choice B, these two angles should add up to 180. And that means this has to be 35. 35 plus 145 makes the 180. Answer choice C, same thing. These have to add to 180. So 180 plus, or 145 plus 35 is 180. 
and then D was a 90 degree angle. So 45 plus 45 made the 90, which means that this angle one is 45 degrees. Okay. This next one is probability. We haven't had a probability um, type of discussion yet. I'm gonna plan that for next time or the time after. It says Leroy has a number cube with sides labeled one through six. He tosses the number cube four times. Each toss results in a five. What is the likelihood that the next toss will result in a five? So when you're doing probability, um, the tosses before don't matter. It doesn't affect what's gonna happen the next time you throw the dice. It can matter, like if you have a bag and you have different colored marbles and you take a marble out and then don't put that marble back in, you've changed the amount. So Kenya says it is D and you are correct. So a number cube is that six-sided dice. So there's six sides and only one of the sides is a five. So the bottom is the total number of sides and the top is how many ways you could get a five. If I gave you the same thing where you have a number cube and said, what's the probability of getting odds? Probability of getting an odd number. And P stands for probability. This is basically saying, what's the probability of getting an odd number? How many ways could you get an odd number on a number cube? Good, three. On the number cube, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. One, three, and five are odd. So it's three, still out of six total. The total hasn't changed. But what does change is this can reduce. What do we reduce this fraction to be? Close. I don't know why the six does this to us, Six divided by three is two. And I still screw that up all the time. For some reason, when we see the six and three, we automatically want it to be three underneath. But we have to remember that six divided by three is two. Um, on the OGT calculator, there's actually a button that will reduce for you. I don't have the camera to show it right now. But if you hit three and then an A, B, C button and a six, your calculator will automatically reduce it to one half. I think we have time for, oh, <laughs> maybe not for that one. That's a free response one. We'll have to do that another day. Um, let's go ahead and take this geometry one. Then we have enough time for this. This net is folded to produce a three-dimensional object and which object will this net produce? These kinds of questions are either really hard or really easy. It really depends on how your brain works. You have to imagine folding this up, and what you wanna look for is what is next to each other. We have a circle, I can't write on that. We have circle, square, circle, square. They alternate. So answer choice A is correct. Um, B has two circles and D is only three triangles instead of the four. So yeah, answer choice B you have to watch out for. It has the right number of sides, but the circles are not next to each other. The circle is directly next to the square. We still have one more minute. Let's do one more. This is another patterns type one. At the beginning of the day, the owner of a restaurant opens a new case of takeout boxes. One case holds 500 takeout boxes. He uses an average of 35 takeout boxes each day. Based on his average usage, which expression represents the number of takeout boxes that remain D days after the new case of boxes is opened? 
Okay, so a couple of answer choices, A options, and that is correct. So we have our starting amount of 500, and then it says he uses the takeout boxes, which means we need to do subtraction instead of addition. Uses is a keyword to know we're taking away. And then that change, 35 each day, goes with the variable. So change always goes with the variable and look for words to tell you if it's addition or subtraction. So we are out of time. Um, if you have any questions, let me know, or any topics you'd like to cover, let me know. And I will be sending out the link for this recording in a couple of hours. It's got to upload and all that, so it takes a little bit. Any questions before we end?